Well, I'm going to continue, as you saw from the front of your bulletin, with the, uh, <clears throat> with the idea of healthy church. Healthy church. And I've covered that two weeks. We had a missionary last week. Interrupted that a little bit. But this is a series that I am actively constructing. This is something I'm not finished with. It's, it's not, I can't use the word constructed in the past sense um, because this is very much a work in progress. And looking back over the past couple of weeks, I've shared with you already how so many, many, many churches in our nation have, have, have gone drastically off track. I'm telling you. They, they have the wrong goals. They're pursuing the wrong goals. And, and because of this, they're, truly they're doing the wrong things. And I don't, I don't, I'm not purposely being critical, but I feel like this is something I need to share with you. I began this about three weeks ago when I told you I need to unburden my heart. This is a burden that I have been carrying as I've made observations about the condition of the church in the United States of America. And I've done it in comparison or in contrast to churches in other continents who really are still acting like the church and understand their mission as the church. And as Pastor Deshaun from Sri Lanka, when he came here, the, one of the first things he said to us was, you know, he's, how disappointed he was in the American church because we are not doing the things that we told them to do. And they're doing it and they're seeing results. But the American church isn't doing this and it's gotten off track. And so these churches, many, many, many churches have, have the wrong strategy. And as a result, they have the wrong methods. And as I also mentioned to you, kind of as a review, because I didn't address this last week, many churches are spending great efforts. And this is where I'm, I'm troubled. Many churches are spending great effort trying to reach Christians. Instead of fulfilling the great commission that Jesus gave us, which requires us to go out and to reach those who don't know Christ, the church's job is not to market to the Christian and promote all the wonderful things they have that that other Christian's church doesn't have. And we've got way too much of that going on. Seriously, I mean, one, you know, you've, you've got some churches that are basically Sears and Kmart. And they're shutting down and they're going out of business. Because other churches are saying, hey, we're Neiman Marcus. And we've got everything. We've got everything. At a price, but we've got everything. And I'm telling you what, that is the wrong track. Because if we're going to market to anybody, it ought to fall in line with Matthew 28, 19, that we're to go to the lost. We're to go to everyone and tell them about Jesus Christ. That's the Great Commission. Our job is not to convince Christians to attend our church. Our job is to tell people who don't know Christ that they need to know Christ for the sake of their eternal salvation. Two weeks ago, I shared you the parable from Jesus that expressed his concern for lost things. Specifically, in that passage, sheep. Or for us people who are lost and need to be found by people who are already found. That's what found people are supposed to do. Go find lost people, make them found people. And so as you can see, there's a very consistent theme that I'm going to carry through week by week. And eventually, I'm going to get into children too. Because that's another area that, that the church is missing it. Not, not us. We've got ministry to children. But I want Christians to wake up. Christians who, who, you know, there's a lot of empty seats here today. I'll admit it. There's a good number of empty seats here. And that means that the, the adults aren't here, which means that their kids aren't here. And I don't know, God, I mean, who knows where they are? Well, God knows where they are. But this week, I want to I begin with a very simple verse from the book of Acts. And first, we're going to read the entire passage so that you have context for the one verse, okay? And so we're going to look at Acts chapter 17, and we're going to look at verse 1 through 9. It says, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, from God's word, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus that I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous. And so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. 
They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. And they are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials are thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Now I want us to double back. I want us to go back just to verse 6. And remember as we just read this, it said that some Jews, there were some Jews who were jealous and they rounded up some bad characters, bad characters who began to accuse Paul and the Christians with these words. And this is what was stated. These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out to you from this passage. First is this. What happened back then is still happening now. It's still happening today. In other words, just as there were people of bad character back then accusing the church, there are also people today of bad character doing their utmost to accuse the church today. Troublemakers for some time now, have been accusing the church of being troublemakers. The very same tactic that we see here in the book of Acts. People of bad character are accusing the church of acting badly, inappropriately. And we see this every day in the fake news, in the media. They want us, the church, to look ignorant on everything. I mean, just as an example, they want us to look ignorant for not caring about various issues like global climate issues. Now, we have a basis for what we believe. This earth will not last forever. Just like trash gets incinerated, someday this whole planet's going to be vaporized. Water once, fire next. Now, I won't be here. And if you know Jesus, you won't be here either. But they, you know, we're, but we're ignorant because we don't care about that issue. They try to defame us for being against such sins as living together, premarital sex, common law marriage, homosexuality. They ridicule us for not wanting to preserve the polar bears and the eagles and other endangered species <clears throat> while we take a stand to try to protect yet to be born human beings. All kinds of government grants and money are trying to preserve wildlife while millions are slaughtered in the womb. I, this world is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's insane. This is a crazy place to live. God, I hope there isn't another planet out there somewhere with people like us. Really? Really? We're in search of life, extraterrestrial life. I just pray that, Lord, this is the only experiment you did. And you know what? We, we do not want to buy into this world's insanity. And because we don't, you know what? They try to make us feel bad. And they try to make us look bad. And they like to judge us as being bad. You see, some things never change. This is 2,000 years old. It's from the book of Acts. It's been going on forever. And not only do they try to defame us and misrepresent who we really are, they're also constantly trying to get us to change on the inside as well through a very subtle form of intimidation. And folks, this is so important for you to grab hold of this morning. Our surrounding worldly culture is trying to convince Christians that we need to change. You know, the message of the gospel says that every human being needs to change. And they want us to change. Christians, uh, uh, this, is, this is that we need, to, we, need to, we need to somehow accept. We need to come around to the world's viewpoint. And they, and they want us to believe that we're mean and we're harsh and we're ugly and we're intolerant. And, and we need to be more loving and accepting. And here's where I can, you know, I, the world's going to do its thing, guys. I'm addressing you. I'm concerned about us. What I'm concerned about is that there are a lot of Christians who are being seduced by this strategy of the world. And as a result, we're seeing a fallout among Christians. 
more and more Christians are paying attention to the bad characters out there who are pointing their finger and they're giving them heed. Christians are giving them heed. And so a lot of Christians are beginning to, to question their inner convictions. And in too many cases, they're changing their convictions in order to line up in, with agreement with the world. You know, again, it was, it, was, it was probably week one when I started the series, but Lauren Daigle, she was asked, you know, is homosexuality a sin? Boy, does she sidestep that issue. I don't know if the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. We know it says it. And I'm not just picking homosexuality. You know, adultery is a sin. Pornography is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. Dissension is a sin. Gossiping is a sin. There's a whole lot of things out there that are bad. And she sidestepped that one because she said, I have friends that are homosexual. And she, you know, she wouldn't want to offend them. You can't, you can't. I'm just, I'm disgusted. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just, I'd be at a loss for words except I got them on my iPad. No, really, really, really. I mean, you can't help but be speechless. How do you, how do you argue the insanity? The insanity. And I'm just here to tell you today, we cannot do this. Because you have a sibling or, or, or someone you know is close to you and they're a homosexual. I mean, you know, would, you, would you accept their adultery as well? And I've seen Christians do this. I've seen Christians approve of adultery. Just look the other way. And they have every excuse in the world. We can't do that. We can't do that. We're actually taught. Paul, 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 I mean, it's a word of God, but Paul utters these words. He says, you know, if you catch a brother, it doesn't mean caught him, you know, you didn't you know, expose him. If you find out that a brother's been caught by sin, your job is to restore them. Not to condone it, to restore them. Well, you know where restoration begins? With a little confrontation. We cannot allow the world to convince us that our convictions are too harsh or too narrow. If your convictions are based upon the word of God, then you're in the right. I want you to know that. You are right where you're supposed to be if your convictions are based on God's word. And believe it or not, my encouragement for you is to remain anchored to the convictions that are born from God's word and his Holy Spirit based upon today's verse. Acts chapter 17 verse 6. These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And for what it's worth, we've been reading from the, I read to you from the New International Version of the Bible, and I got to say, the NIV translation of this verse is really quite weak. The Greek words for cause trouble in the New International Version are better translated from the Greek as this. Not, 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 not cause trouble, turn the status quo upside down. That's the actual translation. Turn the status quo upside down. The Greek New Testament word that's used here is anostato. Anastato. Anastato. Ana is a prefix that means against or back. And stato means equilibrium. And so the New Testament Christians were being wrongly accused by, the trou- by these troublemakers. But they were rightly accused of going against the status quo. And so you see, to successfully stand against the status quo, you have to have a, subir- a superior basis for your own personal convictions. You have, you have to have, a, I mean, a superior, the best. You have to have the best moral anchor. And these people in the New Testament, Acts chapter 17, they knew what they believed and they knew why they believed it. Because from the very beginning of the church and the day of Pentecost, guess what? We're told that they gave themselves to the apostles' teachings. They gave themselves to studying the word of God. They gave themselves to gathering together for times of fellowship and worship. And and all of that is in just the first two chapters of the book of Acts. And this is immediately following the birth of the church. They establish a pattern that every Christian should hold to today. And again, I'm not going to get legalistic about this, but I'm telling you what, you know, I mean, the cafe is open from 8, just as an example, just 8.30 Sunday mornings, it's a time of fellowship. It's free cappuccinos, free chai lattes. I'll just do some advertising. But it's, it's no, it's a, I mean, it's, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. And you know what? You get to just casually talk to people instead of running in, listening to some worship, paying your tithe, running out. You actually get to know people. That's what the early church did. They broke bread together in each other's homes. Acts chapter 2. 
They fellowshiped together. They worshiped together. They gave themselves. They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, in other words it's volitional. It's an act of choice. They, they decided, we need to learn from the apostles about all this happened, about salvation, about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, about the gifts of the Spirit. You can't learn that at home. I mean, you can if you really are an intense, you know, if you really study your Bible intensely. But, but hey, you know, why not get together like we do every Sunday here? The early believers knew what to do to receive sustenance and strength. And folks, believe it, they needed it in order to survive in their world at that time in man's history. Their world was ruled by the Roman Empire. Come on, imagine the corruption, the deprivation of their day. You think, to, you think the times we live in are horrible. Imagine the day in which they lived. And yet they were able to make a difference. And you know what? They so infuriated the Roman Empire that the Roman government put Christians to death. They're not doing that yet to us. You get that? So let's make a difference now. Let's stand up now. Let's say something now. Let's make a difference now. Let's turn our world upside down. The early church didn't just survive in their surrounding oppression. They thrived in it. You know what? They pushed it back. They pushed it back. Babies who weren't aborted were brought to a, a center place in, in, in the city and left there to die. You know what Christians did? Those that were nursing women would go and they'd grab the babies and they'd begin to nurse them and feed them and care for them and then they wound up taking them home. The church, the church of Jesus Christ started the very first orphanages. They pushed back. They pushed back. They didn't just survive. They didn't just survive. They thrived. And here's what I want to suggest to you. We can also make a difference. And we should make a difference. And instead of people becoming so lukewarm in their faith, and some even defecting from the faith, let's do everything we can to bring change. And I might even add in this, I'll, I'll elaborate more another. Don't worry about doing it politically. You know, when it's time to vote, go vote. I don't think you need to march. I don't think you need to protest. I don't think you need to pray. I think you need to maintain your convictions. I think you need to tell the coworker about your faith. Because I shared a couple weeks ago, politics and government is not going to change this world into a better place. They don't have the answer. You do. Let's do everything we can to do what Acts chapter 17 verse 6 told us to do, and that is to go against the status quo. Or as the King James Version said, to turn the world upside down. And trust me when I tell you that the world is upside down. You know, this, there was a straight pride parade held in Boston about a month ago. How many know about it? Straight pride parade. You've heard of gay pride parades, right? This was a straight pride parade. Husbands, wives, you know, heterosexuals proudly walking the streets of Boston. Every media source out there was trying to shame the event. Think about it for a minute, okay? If there can be gay pride, why can't there be straight pride? Why can't I be proud to be married to my wife? What, what is wrong with that? I don't get it. What's wrong? If the issue is about equal rights, then shouldn't both sides of anything have equal access? And equal rights? Isn't that the definition of equal? You can do what I do, and I can do what you do. So you're going to have your gay pride march. I'm going to have a straight pride march. And anyways, as we know from Scripture, homosexuality is a perversion. The Old Testament says it. A, a man should not sleep with a man. A woman should not sleep with a woman. Romans chapter 1 and 2 says the same thing. It's brought into the New Testament, so it's not just Old Testament law. Homosexuality is a perversion of sexuality according to God's word. God said that, right? God said that right. Not psychologists, not psychiatrists, not pastors and preachers. God said it. And yet the president of Emerson College, this is the best the media could get. They got a quote from a president of a college in Boston. And, and ironically, he declared the straight pride parade, quote, in quotes, a perversion. Straight pride is perversion. I'm telling you guys, if it gets more crazy, wait a minute, beam me up, Scotty. My transponder's not working. 
That's for you Trekkies on some over here. They don't know Star Trek. But. Let, me, let me use a current example of what happens when we are not morally anchored. And this is why this, that's why this series is going to morph, it's going to transition to children. Because I am heaven bent on making sure that the next generation of believers doesn't go the way of this current generation. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now, it can't go that way. We've, these kids. Because I see millennials who are drifting away. I mentioned Trey Pearson in a recent message over the past few weeks. Trey Pearson is or was the lead singer of a Christian rock band called Everyday Sunday. And then I came across a truly helpful perspective of what his admission illustrates to us. And I'm going to read to you uh, just a beautiful blog uh, written, well, it's called Deep Roots at Home, which was written by a woman simply known as Jacqueline. I couldn't find anything else about her. But this is what she posted. I mean, masterfully written. I wish I could write like this. <clears throat> wish I could speak and preach like this too. She says, I was recently asked by a friend what I thought about Trey Pearson's decision to abandon his family and come out to the world. I think a lot of things about it, she says. But first, for those that don't know who he is, Trey Pearson is the lead singer of a Christian rock band called Everyday Sunday. In a magazine article and a host of subsequent interviews, Pearson detailed how he never wanted to be gay, but had to be honest with himself. In fact, that was apparently the major impetus behind his decision, as he tweeted. The world's reaction was immediate, tremendously positive for him, Trey even tweeted how overwhelmed he was at the outpouring of support for his decision. And tragically, that support wasn't isolated to the world. Listen to this. Many Christians echoed the world, as is becoming an all-too-often refrain these days in affirming Pearson's decision to live an outwardly homosexual life, retweeting his declaration of finally being honest with himself. And that's what concerns me the most, Jacqueline says. Apparently, the Christianity that Trey Pearson knew and learned, as well as the Christianity practiced by so many professing believers these days, meaning the Christianity that's being proclaimed from so many pulpits, you will not blame this pulpit, but I will blame other pulpits for preaching garbage, has little to no grounding in the authority of God's word. There are a lot of evangelical churches, there are a lot of independent churches in our own area who preach nice, fluffy, wonderful sermons and they're inspiring and they're wonderful and you go home unchanged, unchallenged. She says, I don't just mean the truth that homosexuality is one form of offensive and sinful conduct. I mean the foundational teaching of man's basic state. See, you know, us preachers, we, we run to homosexuality because it's probably the most shocking and the most openly perverse example of sin. But all sin points to the basic state of mankind. And I'm so glad she brought that up. Because I don't want, I'm not trying to beat up homosexuals. I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on one sin in particular. But she says, for any Christian, being honest with ourselves is coming to recognize that we are sinners. That we are pulled towards sinful urges. Every one of us. I don't care who you are. Every one of us. I don't care how close to God you might think you are. She says that we are all pulled towards sinful urges, sexual and otherwise, by a depraved nature that leads us into believing that we can be gods of our own private universes. It requires us to confront the destiny of our sinful souls and choose repentance and reliance on a power that is not of this world. A power that makes the blind to see, the lost found, and the vilest offender of the Christian faith turned into the greatest Christian missionary the world has ever known, the Apostle Paul. It requires us to recognize that no matter how strong the urge to sin may be, no matter how natural or powerful it may appear when compared to our earthly strength, the same spirit that rose Jesus in the grave is available to raise us up out of our deadly desires and designs. Being honest with ourselves means that we acknowledge the way that seems and feels so right to us leads to death. That's Proverbs 14, 12. Being honest, we'll understand that. But rather than be honest with himself, Pearson has actually chosen to deceive himself and sadly so many others into believing that his sinful urge defines him, controls him, and owns him. He's decided to allow it the power to devastate his wife, forever confuse and injure his children, destroy his ministry, and take the throne room of his soul away from Christ. If that latter point seems dramatic, it's only because it is. 
Pearson told Religion News Service, God wants me to be my truest self. I love her response. She says, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. That belief is divorced from any notion of biblical truth. Such a statement like that does not come from a mind surrendered to the will of Christ, but a mind drowned in sinful pride. God tells us repeatedly that the only way to live is to die. Galatians 2.20. This is all God's word. God desires not that we exalt ourselves, but that we die to self. Ephesians 4.22. Believers are to crucify the flesh along with his passions and desires. Galatians 5.24. Jesus himself told us that anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. Mark 8.35. And that anyone who does not take up his cross and follow him is not worthy of him. Matthew 10.38. The Christian life is about denial of self, Colossians 3, 5. But Trey Pearson has chosen to deny God and exalt himself. And he's done so at the cost of everything that God had graciously given to him. A loving wife, children, witness, ministry, and platform. That isn't a decision that any Christian will appreciate, applaud, or affirm. So what happens now? Jesus tells us, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces many seed. John 12, 24. Trey Pearson is currently enjoying the fake love wrapped in the fleeting adoration of the world. Amidst the thunderous applause of men, he neither desires nor is he likely to heed any cautions and warnings from true believers during his hour of earthly adoration and fanfare. But when the invitations onto The View, the show, the interviews with Huffington Post, the congratulatory tweets, when they all begin to fade, Trey Pearson will be, man, he'll be a man alone dealing with his public denial of Christ and with the sin he's chosen to embrace, vainly hoping it will fill a void that only Jesus can fill. I came out of sin. I came out of sin. I, I, know, I know how it stinks. I know how awful it is. My convictions are based on the Word of God, the Spirit of God, my experience with God. No matter what, no matter what temptation, no matter what sinful urge, I would never go back. You cannot leave Christ. You cannot leave such a wonderful gift. And for someone to do this because they're going to be true to themselves and that God would want them to be true to themselves. I love it. No, no He doesn't. God doesn't want you to be true to yourself. And allow me to condense what I just read to you because Pearson and so many Christians today feel as though the highest goal of a human is to be honest to themselves. And as was stated in this blog post, God's word says to forsake oneself, to deny oneself, to resist the temptation to yield to sin. Am I right? You see, the church has been told over and over for so many years that we're engaged in a culture war. Christian behavior versus worldly behavior. I want you to know something. I want you to know, we need to stop believing that. We need to stop believing that it's a culture war because if you reduce this fight to cultural values, then it becomes just a battle over human opinion. You know, really, I mean, Christians believe that a man, a marriage is between a man and a woman. And, a non and somebody out there might believe that it's a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. It's, it, you, you go, if you make this a culture war, it's your opinion versus our opinion. And that is very dangerous territory on any topic. Because we're living in an age where everyone, even among Christians, are hitching their values to their opinions. This is where the church is going off, off track. Christians are hitching their values to their opinions. And as a result, all kinds of behavior is being excused. All kinds of behavior is being accepted. And if you as a Christian, if you live on that level, you know what's going to happen? You're going to want to debate every value that I preach from the Bible. Really? Maybe even today, some of you are like, oh, I don't buy that. I have great homosexual friends and they're wonderful people. You know what the Bible says? Homosexuals are going to hell. So are adulterers. There's a whole list that the Bible, and many times in the New Testament, there's a list of all these people. If they don't repent and come to Christ, they're doomed. And hell's a real place. Two weeks from today, I'm going to talk about the real problem. You do not want to miss that message. The real problem, the real, I mean, it's a big problem. And the church is totally unaware of it. But ultimately, at some point, what's going to happen? If, if your values are based on opinion, 
Ultimately, at some point, you're going to get mad at me. And you're going to seek out a preacher. And you're going to seek out another church. That's going to tickle your itching ears. And you know what? I, I care that you would leave. I care that you would leave. I expect some of you not to come back after a message like this. And after the one I'll bring in two weeks. I expect that. But you know what the Bible says? Those who teach are subject to double the judgment. I will not have you being misled on my... It's not, it, won't, it, won't be, it, it won't be my fault. It won't be my fault. But you will. You're gonna, if you don't like this stuff, you're going to go and you're going to seek out a preacher in a church that tickles your itching ears. Just, hey, just as the Bible predicts will happen in the end times. The Bible says that. You see, we're not in a culture war. We're in a battle between biblical values and what the flesh wants to enjoy. What our flesh wants to accept. And listen to me. What I'm going to say next is the single most important thing I can say today. Really, if, if you know, here it is. I mean, this is it. This is it. Please listen. Only God's word is truth. Now, Jesus said that. Jesus did say that. And I'm telling you again, only God's word is truth. So your opinion, you know what it's worth? Zero. Your opinion doesn't matter to God. You know, it doesn't even matter to Satan. Unless it aligns with his and then, you know, he'll give you a little accolade. Only God's word is truth. And in contrast, I'd also add that the human heart cannot be trusted. Your own human heart your values, your standards, your judgments, your opinions cannot be trusted. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Not only are they worthless, but they can't be trusted. Because God's word in Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the human heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. I don't know if you heard. Did you hear what I said? That was, the, that was God's word. It's right up there. The human heart. The human heart. And for Christians to affirm the sins of other Christians and to applaud their so-called being true to themselves as some kind of high and lofty moral attainment is outright deception. Again, you know, let me remind you of Romans 3, 4, which says, let God be true and every man a liar. So here's the problem. Christians today are trusting in their feelings instead of what God says. Because in order to believe what God says, you have to first know what he says. And you know what? That requires effort. You see, to adopt worldly standards takes no effort at all. It, it, it is constantly being broadcast to you. It's all around you. It flows all around. It takes no effort to go with the flow. But to know God's standards requires that you read his word, that you attend Meetings, when the body gets together, we call it church. That you get out of bed and into a life group at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Ugh, you know. It's 9 a.m. The kids are at the bus stop at the end of my street at 6.30 a.m. They got, I mean, that's Monday through Friday. Saturday, they can sleep all day. I don't care. But Sunday, 9 a.m., that's not that early. Make an effort. Take a stand. And for your sake, and for the sake of your family and those who come behind you, your children and your grandchildren. Maybe you remember this little ditty, if you won't stand for something, then you'll fall for anything. We are not going to make a difference in our world until we become different from the world. And if the world is going to criticize you, let it be for a legitimate reason. Amen? You know, we're told in 1 Peter 2.12, he says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they also may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. In other words, you can make a difference by the way you live. And once again this morning, I want to tell you, Praise Assembly has the best discipleship opportunities of any church in the area. We really do. And tonight we begin vision, just for six weeks. The Bible states that without a vision, the people perish. There's something for everyone tonight, all ages. And every Sunday morning, as I already said, every Sunday morning, starting at 8.30, we have fellowship in the Morning Star Cafe. Wednesday evenings, we have adult Bible study. We have rangers. We have girls' ministries. We have more opportunities here. Christians today, more than ever, need the discipleship that we're offering. And, and, and I'm going to close with this. I want you to know that, that here at Praise Assembly, we're going to continue. 
and an emphasis on discipleship. Whether you participate or not, that's up to you. We're going to continue to be a true family church by providing ministry to every single age from birth to 100 and whatever. We're not, going to, we're not going to go the route of the fad churches with performance worship and darkened sanctuaries and focusing on only one age group over the others, okay? And I want to share this with you. I got an email a month ago. Someone from outside our church. They go to a church um, not too far from here, made up primarily of singles, 20s and 30-somethings. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a growing and thriving fad church. And, and they wrote me asking if they could have their wedding here and if I would do the wedding. And so um, it, it, I didn't respond within one day, so they emailed me again, and I responded then. And so I, I was like, you know, we only do weddings for our own people. Our buildings used too much or too busy. And, and here, she told me the reason she wanted me to do it and she wanted it done here is because their church doesn't do weddings. I'm like, What? What are you supposed to do? Go to the justice of the peace? They don't do weddings, but, you, here, but get this, get this, you may not know this. A lot of churches today don't do communion. Now, we only do it once a month, which is pretty traditional among Protestant churches. You know, if you want, if you want it every week, that's Catholic Mass, but we do it once a month, usually the first Sunday, but there's a lot of churches that don't ever celebrate communion. And there's a lot of churches that don't do Sunday school. They, they, they don't have boys and girls programs. And so I thought about, how do I describe this? I mean, it's like they do a Protestant mass. You know, not a Catholic mass, but a quick one-hour service once a week. And I thought about, that's not church. That's drive through And in weeks to come, I'm going to show you an actual Facebook post on one of the, on the screens, a Facebook post of a pastor in a fairly new church in Newark where the pastor in this post is inviting his congregation to come out to a keg opening? To come out to a bar and have some really, he said, and have some really good beer and watch his daughter sing while his wife serves behind the counter. This is a church that we would consider evangelical. See, the world's going to be crazy. We cannot be. We have got to be sanity in this world. And I, I had thrown this to the, our Wednesday night Bible study folks and said, what would you think, really? What would you think if, if I invited you? Listen, I mean, tonight, instead of vision, let's all go hit a saloon somewhere, you know? Let's, let's go to the pub. You know, let's suck down some suds tonight. Or you know, No, no, no. We'll go to Vision, 5.30, 6.30. Then we'll go out. And my wife will be behind the bar. Huh? And my daughter can't sing. How, how, would you really, would you really respect me preaching the word of God here? And these are born-again Christians that are attending this church. They're born-again Christians that are following the pastor to the keg party. I'm telling you what, really, if there was another, if there was another religion to join, I would join it. Because I, that... Because the world's going to criticize them. Uh, another, another story too, you know, here's, here's uh, you know, and some of you are thinking already, your mind's thinking because, you know, the Bible doesn't, I'm just going to, the Bible doesn't prohibit drinking wine. It, I, I discovered that about six weeks, six years ago, because I was total, I believed in total abstinence after I got saved from alcoholism and delivered from alcoholism. And so there is nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with wine. Drunkenness is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin, clearly. But for a clergyman, for a pastor, for a minister to encourage people to do that. You see, the problem, the reason you go abstinence is because I couldn't control it. And you know what? Any pastor that invites people out to a bar to have some, and said to have some really good beer, you don't know which one of those people is going to go too far. Which one will drink too much that night 
and wind up with a life sentence for, for killing a family, DUI. Or losing their license and having to pay $12,000 to get an attorney to get it back. I, I will not have that on my shoulders. I will not have that on my head. I want to encourage you to do good things. And you don't have to get drunk, but I know how it runs. I know how nobody stopped. I'm very few people, I should say, stop. I don't want to just reflect on my past. I, I'm going off on a tangent. I'm sorry. But I'm really glad that we're a balanced church with balanced ministry. Really. We need to be an outpost for orthodox Christian values and doctrine. I want this place always to be a safe place and a healthy church. And we are. And the one thing we need more of is for you to invite your unsaved or backslidden family and friends because they need what you have. Don't, don't hog it all for yourself. Invite them. And you don't, have, not, you know, don't nag them. Be persistent, but kindly invite them. Invite them. You know, hey, we got this going on. We got that going on. We got a parenting class tonight. You know, maybe you know somebody who could use something like that. And it's a whole different approach. You'll be amazed. But that's the only thing we need more of. We know how to worship in this church. We know how to give in this church. You are so generous. You know, I was with some of our national leaders this week. And they, they know our little church. You know, we're not 10,000 people, but they know about us because of your generosity to missions and giving. The only thing we need more of is to invite the lost, to invite family members that have gone astray. And they might be ready to come back. Just say, look, hey, how about give another try? Because they really need what you have. They need for you to express your concern and your compassion. And so I want us to make it our goal, folks, now more than ever, to turn this world upside down, which is actually right side up. You know that. This world's upside down. But from their perspective, we're messing them up. And if we can mess them up and they get into heaven, that's all we were called to do.